July 1941, General Douglas MacArthur was recalled into active duty. General Douglas MacArthur was one of the youngest generals in the United States military. And he had been sent to the Philippines multiple times to, to help the young Filipino government put a military force together. But because of funding restrictions, the Filipino government had a ragtag army with obsolete equipment and weapons. And so in 1941, General MacArthur relocated to the Philippines, and there he started training and equipping this ragtag Filipino army. And for your history buffs, you know that in 1941, the history of the United States changed significantly. Because on the 7th of December of that year, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And that was a, <laughs> that was a, a devastating blow to the United States. But what we are going to look at today is that the Japanese not only bombed Pearl Harbor in the United States, but they bombed the Philippines soon after. A day or two thereafter, they bombed the Philippines and invaded them because the Philippine Islands was a strategic point for the Japanese as they hoped to enlarge their empire. The ragtag Filipino army and the 22,000 American troops in support of them tried to fight back desperately. But the elite, well-trained Japanese army with the, the most up-to-date weapons overran them speedily. And they kept retreating, and they kept retreating, and they kept retreating right down to the Bataan Peninsula, where they were hoping to hold their forces until relief would come and supplies would come to reinforce the army. But because America was caught off guard, and the war was just in its initial phases, the supplies never arrived, and the reinforcements never arrived. A tragic, tragic story. And the American high command realized that Douglas MacArthur could not hold that ground, and they whisked him away to Australia to regroup and re-strategize. But Douglas MacArthur loved the Philippines. Douglas MacArthur, his heart was broken that, that the Filipinos would have to surrender to these ruthless, brutal Japanese. And from Australia, he made a speech reassuring the Filipino people, saying, I shall return. Those famous words. And the Filipino radios broadcasted that message, and they were all very um, hopeful that General Douglas MacArthur would keep his promise and come back and rescue them from this catastrophe that happened to their nation. And no matter what the Japanese threw at them, in the back of their minds, the Filipinos believed that he would keep his promise. And so we dive right in to the first session of our series, Generals to the Rescue. So in your sermon notes, number 2A, You'll see the underlined word for you to fill into your notes. The people in the Philippines count, counted on General MacArthur's promise. But although we are in a worse crisis than the people in the Philippines, in that we could face eternal death, do we st still live our lives ignoring the promises of Christ's return? My friends, the Lord Jesus Christ the general of the heavens has made a promise to each one of us. And what did he say? I shall return. I shall return. So if you've got those words filled in there, we are in a worse crisis. Why are we in a worse crisis? 
We are in a worse crisis because we're not up against the Japanese army. <laughs> we are up against the forces of evil, whose goal it is to destroy us forever, not just to take over our country. But General Jesus has promised that he would come back. So just if you um, got your words filled in there, um, I'll move on to the next slide. Anyone still busy? So let's look now at the summary of the promises of Christ's return. If you've got a Bible that was handed to you at the counter, you'll see the page number there. Matthew 16, 27. And remember the, the bolded, italicized words I'd like you to read with me. The underlined ones are the ones that are left out in your notes. Read with me. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. The first two words there, he will come. The second um, beautiful scripture of Jesus' promise to return is found in John 14, 1 to 3, page 1042. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now, read with me. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The two underlined words again, come again. How often do we feel discouraged about life on this planet? How often do we get overwhelmed? How often do we feel like we're up against a brutal invading force that's causing us heartache, confusion, poverty, sickness, loss of a loved one? What does Jesus say? I will come again and receive you unto myself. Isn't that beautiful? Now, Acts chapter 1, verse 9 to 11, page 1051 in the participation Bibles, participant Bibles rather. Now, when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Verse 10, while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? Read with me. This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Your missing word there is come. Why are you standing up gazing? Why are you confused? This same Jesus will come back in like manner that you saw him going up. Isn't that an exciting, beautiful promise? So here we have multiple promises in the Word of God that Jesus will come back. The question we have this morning now is, are we going to take these promises seriously and are we going to Build our lives around this promise. The Filipino people, when the Japanese were talking, ah, ah, General MacArthur is going to come and save us. How often do we stake our lives on this very promise in a practical, real manner from day to day? So in, your, in 2B in your notes, it says, the Bible says God makes strong promises and gives thorough warnings. But man ignores these and is caught unawares. Look what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 37 to 39. And once again, we've got two missing words there. Read with me. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood... 
They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. God makes the promise. God gives the warning. Jesus is coming back. How often do we hear people talking about the second coming? It says that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it again be in the end time. And how was it in the days of Noah? Well, <laughs> here we have it. In the days of Noah, Noah sent out a warning to the people. How long did he preach? How many people went into the ark? Eight. So, of all the whole population of the then known world, eight people went into the ark. And people were just carrying on with business as, as normal, eating, drinking, giving in marriage, doing the things that life puts before them. And the flood came and only eight people was, were saved. That is real scary. And so Jesus is saying, as it was in the days of Noah, so it's going to be again in the last days. But notice what happened with Christ's first coming. It was the same thing. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage, going on with business as normal. And Jesus came, and how many people knew about it? It was also about eight or ten, maybe twelve people. The shepherds. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us how many shepherds there were. And it doesn't exactly tell us how many wise men there were, although they gave three gifts. So we assume there were three wise men. And then we have Anna the prophet and Simeon the prophet that recognized him in the church who were praying for his coming. Herod heard about it after the fact from the wise men and he was so upset about it that he went and slaughtered all the young babies. But the fact of the matter is, my friends... People are tuned out of God's promise that He has given about Christ's return. People are tuned out. And we ask ourselves the question, where are you and I at? Are we going to be caught unawares like in the day of Noah, when the ark door was closed and the final call made and people still laughed at His face? What are you doing in that big obstacle, with that big boat. They didn't know it was a boat. It was just like a big hunk of wood. The Bible declares that in the last days, men will be absorbed in word, worldly pursuits. This is in your notes or on the screen. In pleasure and money getting. They will be blind to eternal realities. Men are rushing on the chase for gain and selfish indulgence as if there were no God. Wow. No heaven and no hereafter. In Noah's day, the warning of the flood was sent to startle men in their wickedness and call them to repentance. So the message of Christ's soon coming is designed to arouse men from their absorption in worldly things. It is intended to awaken them to a sense of eternal realities that they may give heed to the invitation of the Lord's table. That's from a beautiful little book called Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen White. And that's on page 228. I want to tell you a little humorous story. This is Key West. I was the pastor in Key West for about four years. And this was after um, Hurricane Wilma. And there's a group of people in the Keys called conks. They were kind of born in the Keys and raised in the Keys. And hurricanes don't scare them. And one of my church members in the Keys is a conk. And um, the Weather Channel and all the local channels were warning that people should evacuate and get out of the Keys because even though this wasn't a, a storm with high winds, it was going to push a lot of water through. Now, I'm from South Africa. We don't have extreme weather in South Africa. 
here and there an isolated account. But mostly we don't. So when, I, when the Weather Channel says a hurricane is coming through with a, between two and four foot storm surge, guess what the South African does? He runs to Home Depot and he scans the shelves. He does all kinds of pre preparation in order to prepare for this coming storm. What do the Kongs do? Nah, nothing's going to happen. So I bump into my church member in Home Depot and I say to him, are you going to buy sandbags? to put around your front door and your back door? Nah, nah, it'd be fine. There's nothing wrong. No, it, 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 we've, in 1948 was the last storm surge we had here in the Keys. Okay, that's fine. And here I am carrying sandbags on these heavy carts, putting them, wheeling them to my car, weighing down the back of the car, filling it with sandbags, taking them to my house, coming back to Home Depot, loading my car up again, riding back to the house, until I've got enough sandbags that will cover the front of the garage, the front door, and the back door. I buy plastic sheeting to put against the door with the sandbags against the plastic sheeting. I bump into him again at Home Depot. What are you doing here? Oh, no, he's just buying a, a new light socket. I said, aren't you going to put up sandbags around you? I really think you should. I think there's, there's a storm surge going to come through here. No, 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 it's all fine. I pack my whole home with sandbags. I, I even bought ramps for my car to, to get the engine up off the ground in case a storm surge came. And I got in my car and I got out. After the storm passed, I came back. This is what we saw. Between two and six feet came through the Florida Keys. This church member's home had between two and three foot of water that came through his home. His beds, his, any furniture that had um, cloth material on it was damaged. Sandbags at Home Depot could have made a big difference. You see, my friends, God puts out the warnings this catastrophe called sin is going to end. I shall return, he says. Are we staking our lives on this promise? You see, sermon notes number 2C says, what is needed for people to take what is needed for people to take God's promise as seriously as they, as they take the warnings issued by the federal government, the severe forecasters, and the military leaders. God's warning stands. But it's kind of pushed aside and yeah, 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 we've heard that before. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So people need to take the warnings that God has put for us and God's promises as seriously how does acting on God's promises impact our lives? Is there, a, is there a difference in our lives because of God's promise? Or is our life still the same? And the story of Abraham is a sterling example of somebody who took God's promises seriously. Number 3A in your notes. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And so turn either in your Bibles or up here on the screen, in your notes, Hebrews 11, verse 8 to 10. And I want to read three passages to you about how Abraham acted on God's promises. Abraham acted. He, he made a physical decision to do something when God said, Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Leave your home and leave your family. And look what happened. In the, in the faith chapter in Hebrews, what does it say? By faith Abraham obeyed as he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as his inheritance. Read with me. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as a foreigner in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob the heirs with him of the same promise. 
For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. If you read up in the story in Genesis, Abraham left his father Terah. He, le he left his family and he went to a place where God would show him. Because he acted on God's promise that I'm going to make you the father of a great nation. Did he see direct evidence of that? No, he didn't. He acted on the unseen. Romans 4, verse 17 to 22. Romans 4, verse 17 to 22. God, who gives life to the dead and who, who calls things which do not exist as though they did. Powerful scripture. Who, contrary to hope, in hope believed so that he became the father of many nations. According to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old. And the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Read with me. And being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore... It was counted to him for righteousness. My friends, when we believe God, when we believe what he said, it's credited to us as righteousness. Because, my friends, God promises some pretty amazing things. Pretty amazing things. Abraham was 100 years old. I think Sarah was 99, somewhere around there. They were both either in their 90s or their 100s. Healthy 100, right? <laughs> and um, God says you're going to have a son. He promised him that. It was the impossible. But he believed God's promise. Now comes the test. God promises him. And then God tests his faith. Hebrews again, chapter 11, verse 17 to 19 says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Read with me. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. My friend, so Abraham is making his life decisions on the promise that God made to him. Jesus has promised to come back. Are we making practical, real life decisions based on that promise. It's so inspiring to read back the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. People from the Baptist, the Methodist Church, um, Presbyterian churches came together and started studying the Bible. And they realized that Jesus was coming back soon. Now, this was in the 1800s. And so... They realize that if Jesus is coming back soon, that they need to prepare a people to meet the Lord. And what they did was they sold their possessions. They all moved into a building that they rented. And they started a publishing press called the Review and Herald. And all the money that they'd received from selling their possessions and their homes, they used to print the Review and Herald in order to get the message out that Jesus is coming back soon. Now that's what I call making a practical decision based on the promises of God. Now let me tell you, it's not easy to do. It's kind of the ultimate test. 
Sermon notes number 3b, how different would our lives be if we really believed that Jesus' promise about his soon return was really true? Like Abraham, we would be prepared to, one, leave our homes, our unbelieving families, or country. We would believe God's promises, although they seemed impossible, like being 100 years old and having a baby. And number three, we'd be willing to sacrifice everything and anything, just like Abraham was willing to sacrifice his own son. That's practical. That's real. Here's a picture of me in, um, in the Manzum Todi, South Africa, that's at my counter in the fitness center. This is me taking a group exercise class. I was in the perfect life, so to speak, running my own business, doing a great job owning a fitness center. And my dad was here in the United States. And every now and again, my dad would call me up and says, Andre, you need to come to the United States. There are better opportunities here. Um, it's a bigger country. You c there's many various op alternatives for ministry opportunities. You need to come to the United States. Oh, Dad, but I've got my business here. I'm not going to be able to establish myself. I've got a place to stay. I don't know where I'll stay when I'm in the United States. My dad says, listen, if you come over, we will help you get started. He made me that promise. Now, was I going to believe his promise? Did I know how he was going to unfold that promise? No, I didn't. It took me five to seven years to make up my mind that I was going to come to the United States. Because to leave your country, to sell your car, to sell your home, to basically pack everything you own into two suitcases and to walk onto that plane is a very daunting thing. But I decided to take the step. I decided to accept my father's promise as being true. Because I had a relationship with my father, I knew that when he said something, he would do it. So I handed off this business. South Africa's economy wasn't good enough to sell the business. So I handed off the business. I took basically the cash that was in the bank, which was 20,000 South African dollars, which translated into 4,000 American dollars with two suitcases. 4,000 bucks in my back pocket, and off I went to the United States of America. Now, my dad had been living here since 1984. He was established, and he's a very resourceful person. I found out that he, had a little, he, had, he, he bought a little three-acre property in the mountains of Tennessee, a little town called Altamont, and there was an old trailer on that property. As you can see, it's pretty old. So I said, Dad, if I can take my $4,000 and buy that property, because that's what he paid for it. I said, if I can give you the $4,000, at least we could possibly remodel the trailer and put a tenant in it, and I'd have some kind of an investment in the United States. And he said, yes, I'm going to help you. Well... What my dad says was, rather than just putting a small little roof on the trailer, why don't we build a porch at the back? Why don't we put a stud wall around that trailer and put a joint roof over both the porch and the trailer to make it look like a house? So, wow. And he helped me to do that. You can see the old trailer in here still. You see? There it is. But look at this brand new porch. Look at the high ceiling. Look at me standing on top of that. We worked for six solid months just to get this to a place where, look at that, no old trailer. It looks like a nice house, doesn't it? <laughs> That's what I did when I first came to the United States. Th there's my dad in the kitchen. We eventually built a whole new house and we tore the trailer out the inside. <laughs> Andre, come to the United States. I will help you. I counted my dad's promise as worthy. I acted on his promise. 
I'll finish telling you the story now. There I am outside the house, a new house that we had rebuilt. I paid 4000 for it. My dad invested in the two by fours and helped me with the shingles and the, and the roof trusses and everything. We sold that home for 65000 I had an investment in the United States. A few calluses to show, but it was such a rewarding, fulfilling experience. By faith, Abraham left his home and went to a land that he did not know. My friends, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back again. How, how is that impacting our lives practically? How are we seeing our lives into the future? Are our lives any different to our next door neighbor? Are we focused on the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ to show His character, His love, His kindness to the world? Are we investing everything that we have to be able to get the message out like our early pioneers? Or are we doing business as normal? Like our neighbors, our work colleagues, our school friends? Or are we changing our lives practically in order to be ready and to make our family and friends ready when Jesus comes? Sermon notes number 3C. The question we ask ourselves this morning, my friends, is God still able to repeat the promises He made to the Israelites in our time to provide food and water? Is God still able to heal our diseases and give us victory over sin? Is God still able to perform the miracles He performed in ancient times? Yes or no? When you pick up your Bible and you read the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, it kind of blows your mind that they sold everything and they gave to those who had need. How does that practically work in our modern time? How many people have lost jobs recently? How many people are looking for jobs now? There's quite a few in our church. There are people around us in need. Early Christians sold everything they had, they brought it to the church, and they distributed to those who are in need. How does that work? Well, if God could provide for the Israelites in the wilderness where their shoes never wore out, their clothes never wore out, they had water and they had this wonderful buffet of manna, manna soup, manna stew, manna toast, manna porridge. But God provided for their needs. And the question I ask this morning, if we were to step out like Abraham did, because we know the Lord Jesus is coming soon. Because we know the world is looking to see if the church is relevant or not. Are we willing to step out and be vulnerable, be in need, and be in the place where if God doesn't step in, we're in trouble? Are we willing to go into that place? My friend, that is the place that I believe those looking forward to the second coming of Christ are called to stand where they are called to stand. Sermon notes 4a. Did you notice what Jesus attached to the promise of his return? Did you notice? He says, let not your heart be troubled. Missing words. Our unwavering belief in God's promises offers us, uh, us power and strength. What does Romans 8.31 say? Read it with me. If God is for us, who can be against us? Right now, God is holding the universe together. It's so vast that the scientists can't even invent something to see the end of it. It's so big. God's holding this whole universe together by the breath of His mouth. He is so powerful. But yet, he, I am panic struck in my circumstances. And I'm not willing to let go of something to help someone else. Because I'm so busy 
trying to make my little world secure. I pray that God will give me the faith of Abraham. I pray that God will give me the faith of great men of faith like George Mueller, Joseph Bates, James White, Ellen White, Uriah Smith, the four, the, the pioneers of our church who sold everything just so they could get the next paper out to announce to the world that Jesus is coming again. The promises of God are powerful. But my friends, they are also practical. They engage us in our ever, everyday life. John 14, 1, 2, 3. We saw that Jesus laid the promise out very clearly. Let not your heart be troubled. He believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Do you believe that today? Do you believe that today? Second Peter 1 verse 3 and 4. This is how powerful God's promises are. This is how powerful God's promises are. It says, as His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. Read with me. By which we have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What happens through God's promises? What happens because of God's promises? We can participate in the divine nature. We can participate in the divine nature. Number four B, if we live by Christ's promises that His death provides forgiveness and cleansing of sin, His resurrection provides victory over sin and death, and His ascension provides His intercession and the infilling of His Spirit, and His return will take us home with Him, we will experience His divine transforming power. We will experience His divine and transforming power. There's nothing in our lives that God's promises does not cover. Okay, so Jesus invites us to live by the power of His promise return, number 4C. How? As we pray, when we come to God with our petitions and we pray, We can either doubt or we can really believe that what he says is true. But sometimes when we pray, we, we don't really believe the very promises that we are claiming. We believe God is in slow motion, way behind where we are, and it will take him a long, long time to get engaged with us. This is what God has been saying to me lately. Before you pray, ask for the Holy Spirit to illuminate your mind as to who you are praying to. Before you pray, ask the Holy Spirit to open your mind to see that God's promises aren't just made lightly. Before you pray, ask for the Holy Spirit to give you a vision of how God's promises have impacted you in the past and others in the past. So that when you pray the prayer, God, provide a job for me. You are speaking to this 
mighty monarch of the universe that's got the universe in the palm of his hand that speaks order and control and sustenance into the universe and that he can and will answer your prayer. So in our prayers, the way we pray, we engage the promises of God. Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. There's kind of a, a parallel between John 14, isn't it? It says, read with me, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So how do we live by the power of His promised return? We keep it in every prayer we pray. Lord Jesus, you promised you're coming back. I'm praying for a job now. Show me how this job is going to connect with your promised return. Father, I'm, I, I can't pay this bill. Show me how this bill connects with your promised return. Father, I'm having a, an issue at church with... Uh, one of the fellow members there, show me how that relates to your promised return. Father, I've got a family issue. I've got an a, 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 a issue with my colleague at work. Show me how that connects with your promised return. Everything needs to be connected to his promised return. I love this quote. Look here. This is the Review and Herald. This is what they sold everything for to publish this magazine and just get it out to the world. Select prayer, which is too much neglected. Sorry, secret prayer. I beg your pardon. Secret prayer, which is too much neglected, is the life of the Christian. Let us go to God alone and fix our minds upon Him, have everything else shut out, and then draw by living faith Light and strength from the sanctuary. Let us not rise from our knees until we can rely upon God's promises with an unwavering faith. Can I read that again? Let us not rise from our knees until we can rely upon God's promises with what? Unwavering faith. Stay there until the Holy Spirit gives you a vision of who you're talking to. Until the Holy Spirit gives you a vision that that promise that you claiming is secure and is backed up by the mighty monarch of the universe. General Jesus doesn't make promises lightly. Then we shall be benefited by secret prayer. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus invites us to live by the power of his promised return as we plan. You know, lately I've been involved in a lot of planning, both for the church and for the Mercy Network and for Mercy Support Services. And we put together a year plan, a strategy, a strategic plan, we call it. My friends, is Christ's soon return part of our strategic plan, our year plan? Our plans need to include the fact that everything in the world will pass away, but investing in the things of God will pay back what? The ultimate return. So not only is Jesus coming, which is the ultimate return, but when we invest in the currency of heaven, we gain the ultimate return. Matthew 6, 19 and 20 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. What's the last sentence say? For where your heart, your treasure will be, sorry, <laughs> read that again. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And finally, as we prioritize, What comes first? <coughs> what comes first? <laughs> I hate to make this confession. But for a long time, 
when I finally convinced that Apple was a, a good option for electronic devices, I started getting caught up in the Apple frenzy. Because you see, Apple doesn't tell you what next is coming out. There's just rumors. And so you read the rumors, you know, in the technology magazines, and they say the next iPhone's going to have this, and the next iPad's going to have this. And so you get more and more curious, and you get more and more curious. And finally, you can't stand it any longer. When, the, when that keynote speech comes out of what the next Apple product is, you tune in on the internet, and there you are listening, what the, what the next product's going to be. And then you're so excited that you saw this new improvement. You rush down to the Apple store, and you get in line, and you, and you scramble through, and you, you, you elbow yourself through to the front of the line, and you buy the latest Apple product. And yes, I got caught up in that. I bought, the, I bought the iPhone 3S back in the day, and then the iPhone 4 came out with so many better features. So my wife got the 3S, and I bought the 4. <laughs> and then the 4S came out, and then I just decided, no, this is, this is crazy. You can't do this. So I weathered the storm, and I looked at the keynote, but I wasn't going to buy a 4S and then the five came out and I looked at the keynote and I thought, man, that's nice, but I'm not going to buy the five. And then the 5S came out and I had to buy one. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to buy a six, I promise. <laughs> but can you see the priorities? And um, my little personal allocation that comes into my bank account from, my, from the monthly wage was very neatly guarded. I didn't touch it for two months so that I could go about it out and buy the 5S 64 gigabyte, the top of the range. Priority. I wonder how many flies I could have printed for $399. Priority. I think the Lord told me to preach the series, you know, for who? For me. Because my friends, it has an impact. If we truly believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming, and the irony of the whole thing is, the Lord Jesus Christ's coming is not only in the sky for those who are living. When else does the Lord Jesus Christ come? When I happen to not make it to that day. Remember in the last years we preached about reaching the culmination of our faith? If we happen to breathe our last, the quick passage to meeting God, I could turn out of this drive today and not look properly or be distracted with my five phone, I, 5S <laughs> and ride off the road or get hit by another vehicle. The Lord Jesus Christ comes right there and then for me. And that's why Every prayer I pray, every plan I make, and every priority that I shift up and down the list should be under the auspices of Christ's soon return. Under the auspices of Christ's soon return. When the promise of Christ's return is on the forefront of our thinking, we will make the expansion of God's kingdom our first priority. Our first priority. Matthew 6.33, read with me. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If you need the missing words in your notes, I'll leave this outside in the lobby. You can come look through it. But my friends, I pray that the messages that we go through, through these eight weeks, will create a whole new sense of awareness in each one of us. Jesus has promised, I will return. This morning, I want to ask you, how many of you want to practically engage your life with that promise? Let me see this morning. We've got nothing else, praise God. My friends, we have nothing else. 
Every presidential can candidate comes to the podium and makes all these promises about changing things in the world. And what happens? It all falls flat. And uh, the president's ratings go up the first six months, and then from there on they go down until they want to go and throw him out by the scruff of his neck. No human being can change the conditions in this world. It's the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ that is the answer for this world. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you that we can engage this subject by faith. And Father, personally, I ask for forgiveness for having put so many things above the preparation and the practical engagement of Christ's soon return. And I thank you that General Jesus made the promise, I shall return. And Father, may we stake our hope, may we stake our lives, may we stake every decision, every plan, every prayer, every priority on that promise. We pray for revival today, Lord Jesus, individually, to get up in those early quiet morning hours and have your spirit fill us and illuminate our minds. We pray for revival in this church. We pray for revival in the churches in Clay County. We pray for revival in the leadership of Clay County, the government, the nonprofits. We ask that the awareness of Christ's soon return will be everywhere. Lord, we don't just want eight or 12 people to know about your second coming. We want the world to be ready. Amen. And we pray for that this morning in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. For those of you who don't know or are visiting with us, we transition every service into a prayer service. The ladies come to the front of the church. The men go back.